Welcome to the Black Spray Hood podcast. Today we're interviewing Alex Douglas, a local historian and guide from the southernmost of the Grenadine Islands, Union Island. Welcome, Alex. Welcome, welcome to you all. <laughs> welcome to Chatham Bay in the Caribbean Sea. It's a lovely place to be. I'm saying this to all, one and all. Welcome to Chatham Bay again and again. So, Alex, what can you tell us about Union Island? I can tell you a lot about Union Island. After all, I'm the local historian for the visitors. I used to teach the local kids, but we had problems with the kids and their parents, so I resorted to teaching the visitors. I can tell you a lot about Union, so let's go ahead. Union Island is a small island. It's only three square miles in length or in size. That's the size of the island. So it's a very small island. The population is about approximately 4,000 people, like this. And uh, why was it called Union is a very interesting question. The first British settlers, which were not the first European settlers, when they arrived, they were slave traders. And it is said that they had a boat that were trading up and down the islands and livestock and food and stuff from that whatever, marine stuff, and their boat was called Union. The island probably at the time was just called the island, and they thought it's a good name to give the island. So from there on, they started calling the, the island the Union Island, and the name stuck. And what can you tell us about the pre-Columbian history of the island? It's a very good one. Well, it is said that even before Christ, what we know today as the Caribbean, or the West Indies, they were inhabited by prehistoric people who were Indians from the northern coastal parts of South America. One of those tribes were called the Tainos or the Siboney Indians. They were the first, or said to be the first ones to arrive. They were followed by the Arawak Indians and then third and final, the Caribs. These are the ones which have a lasting impact on the islands. This is why the islands are really known as the Caribbean. And um, what can you tell us about the Colombian history? Or well, the Colombian history... Sorry, not Colombian. Colonial, post-colonial. The post-colonial history, I know, has to do with... Uh, Christopher Columbus and those guys coming into these parts. It is written, it is said, written and said, historically speaking, that Union Island had its first encounter with the white man sometime during the 1700s. I cannot tell you exactly what year it was, but in this time period, Europe was in a big war at the time. It was known as the Seven Years' War in Europe. But that war was also extended across to the Atlantic into North America because it's a colonial war. In North America, it is known as the French and Indian War. You understand that? So when these guys came, this war was in progress and it was not long, long after they came or arrived on Union, the war came to an end under a treaty known as the Treaty of Paris. A lot of people probably might have heard of that. So under that treaty, there were lots of concessions between those big colonial powers. For example, France had to give a junk of North America up to the British. The big empire she had in North America, she had to pass it on to Britain. Even some places in Asia and in the Caribbean down here, this is why we speak English today, but France was our first colonial people. Where did you learn your history? I started out at school and it was very interesting to me because I started to get into the Rastafarian business and there's a lot of history in that in that society so I start following history in school and then when I came from school I was too poor to go to college or to go to some other faculty institution to get educated so I just started educating myself historically speaking scientifically speaking, 
I like marine. I like marine studies. And I'm a, now I'm an amateur marine biologist. But no one will hire me as a marine biologist. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us then what kind of plants and animals do you have on the island and also in the waters surrounding the island? Well, they are all tropical plants. Some are perennial, some are seasonal. Uh, we have the acacia, we have mangoes. We have different types of mangoes, a few different types of mangoes. We have the papaya, we have the coconut. We have some other trees that are used mainly for firewood. Some of them I don't know their real names, but we have local names for them like Atchet Andal. This is a very good combustible wood. It's good for fire. We have the acacia. We use it to make the charcoal, to make the delicious barbecue for the visitors. And we have animals like the tortoise. We have indigenous animals like the iguanas. We have spiders, different spiders, and they recently they have found an indigenous gecko on the island, and it is said to be one of its kind in the world. Wow. Yeah, it's rare. You know, so right now there is a preservation of, of the forest, and I love it this way. We need to conserve. Talking to you earlier, you mentioned that climate change is having a big impact on the island. Can you tell us what effects it's been having? Well, anyone with sense at all, don't get followed suit by the crazy President Donald Trump because everyone knows he's a crazy guy. We are having our fair share of climate change issues too because we don't get as much rain as we used to and I'm sure it's a climate change issue. The temperature is rising, we can feel it, it's hotter, you understand? And because of those two main factors, the vegetation is depleting, the people don't have enough water sometimes, and it's very annoying, it's very annoying. So what can we do? We need to be innovative, we need to collaborate, we need to get together and get something, work something out, try to turn salt water into fresh water. It's not very hard, but we make it seem hard. Yeah. So you mentioned that you followed the recent COP26 talks in Glasgow yeah. very avidly. What, were you impressed with the outcome of the talks or do you think it was or well, didn't go far enough? I, I, I don't think it went far enough. You know, those, those big entrepreneurs who call themselves energy giants for example, Shell and BP and Mobile Exxon, I think they can be much more innovative in renewable energy, you know, they can... There's a lot of money to make in it, you know, I mean, the innovation may not be cheap, it may not be very quick, but there's a lot they can do, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be good for people's economies for sure. to go down this route anyway. For sure. So, and save the world at the same for time. For sure. Why not? Who wants to ruin the planet? The bad guys? We are not the bad guys. We are the good guys. Yeah. So, um, can you tell us about the political system in St. Vincent and the Grenadines? How does it work and what do the two main political parties stand for? Well, we have 15 constituencies allegedly. We have about 13 of them on the mainland St. Vincent and two of them in the Grenadines Island. So from Bekwe down to Union Island including Palm Island and Petit St. Vincent would be considered the Southern Grenadines. No, so I'm sorry, from Kanawan down to Union Island including including uh, Palm Island, Palm Island and, 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 and Petit St. Vincent, they would be considered the Southern Grenadines. And then we have from Beckway Mustique up to the mainland St. Vincent, that's the Northern Grenadines. Now between the Northern and Southern Grenadines, there are 15 constituencies. Each constituency has a representative of both parties. And that's how it works. We have an election system of a period of five years. So our last election was in the year 2020. So 2025, we're going to have our another election. Well, the two parties, what they stand for, 
you know politics is very sometimes hard 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 to define you know they they come and they preach for you what they can do and when they're going to do it and how they're going to do it but when we put them there with the ballot they don't seem to want to do what they say or what the people want so what do they stand for i think it's the same thing yeah i think that's the problem everywhere pretty much yes do you think the grenadines should have more autonomy well some people talk about it and with the attitude of some mainlanders even in the political system towards the grenadines it was a big talk among some Grenadines people, but they probably don't know exactly how to go about it. But if we have autonomy and we can survive economically speaking, who would hate that? I would love that. Okay. And they probably didn't like him because he was popular, so they f find a way to topple him. That's my opinion, simple as that. But Brazil is a lovely place. Some people are very nice. Most of them are very nice, but there are some bad people, I'm sure. I've never been there. But I'm sure there are some bad people. I like the women, you know. I like the jungle. I like your animals. I like the Amazon. But it's a pity that this guy you have there now, this Hitler guy you have there now, that is called what's it's called Bolsonaro or something like that. Bolsonaro. Yes, I think he's destroying the entire lungs of the world. So, what are you guys going to do for next election? Let's get rid of this guy. Come on. How do people in Union Island make a living? Well, it's a diversity. Some people can be attached to the educational system, which is related to government. So you have like school teachers. You have some people that are dealing with construction. Some people are working in the tourist industry and some in the fishing industry. As for me, I'm in the tourist and fishing industry. You know, and that's about it. Some people do whatever they can to survive. And are there enough jobs here or do some people go to St. Vincent or some of the other islands to get work? Yes, yeah, some people go to some of the other islands. For example, when those big investors were coming into Canawan, lots of people left the island and went to Canawan to look for jobs. I didn't go because I didn't have a good relationship with no one in Canawan, but I think it worked out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, um, how were people affected by the pandemic? You've mentioned tourism as being one of the main industries here. Mm -hmm. Well, during the pandemic, just like many other places, we have a tourism-based economy because we have lovely scenery that the visitors love. You know, we are lovely people. We came on the came out on the French and English colonialism. You know, so we are not very bad people. There's not a lot of drugs here. But our island still stands as a transit point for drugs from South America. It's a pity to say, but that's the reality. But the pandemic has had a negative impact on us. There was no visitors during that time. And we had a lot of restrictions among the local people. There were a few deaths that were reported on St. Vincent. So some people were scared, you know, people had to stay indoors and, you know, couldn't see their relatives, couldn't go what do their daily work, you know, so it was not very easy. And did the government give financial support as well? Well, I think some people who fell under the criteria of really needing help, I think they got some assistance from the government, you know, I think, but uh, probably they didn't assist as much as they, they should or they could, but I think they did give some assistance. Okay. Um, because, because, excuse me, because... Uh, they provided uh, uh, the vaccine very early and they had a lot of information on, 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 on social gathering and sanitizing and stuff like that. And so it was good. I think they, they did support. Yeah. They did a good job. Yeah, they did a good job. Oh, that's good. And then um, what do you like to do in your spare time? Smoke ganja, read, listen to music. Try to find someone that I can chat with on a positive level, which is sometimes very hard because there are not many positive people on the island. They're all into fantasy and fun and quick life, you know, but I'm not really into that. I like, I, I love reality. So that's what I do in my spare time. Okay. And uh, you mentioned one of your favorite things to do is smoke jan ganja. Yes. And uh, when did it become legalized here? It became legalized about maybe four or five years ago 
under the pretext of, of medicine, you know, but they're not just using it as medicine, they're shipping it out whole, wholesome. You know, they're making a lot of money from it now, but they're still locking people up. Oh, really? Yes. I mean, if you have a certain amount of ganja, they're going to lock you up. They're not going to say, oh, it's, it's legal, but you just need to go, don't try to make no trouble with it, and you no, know, they're going to lock you up. So that's the people that are growing it without a license? Yes, the that's government? right. That's right. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. And um, does the government tax what the people make from growing it? Do they I, get tax money from I, it? Yes, I think it, it's all tax. Well, once it's government owned business, it all has to do with okay. taxation, right? Yeah. So that's, that's the basic thing with government, right? Yeah. yeah. And who are, they, who are they selling it to? Well, they're selling it to Europe, to America, whoever wants to buy it, South America. Well, not South America because you guys grow some of the world's most abundant ganja, so I guess Europe. But are they selling South it to America. places only where it's already being legalized? Well, I guess I guess the the quality, the the level of THC and the level of CBD, you know, this is what is required, you know. So, since they found out that it's therapeutic, and they yeah. can use it for medicinal use, ah, and it okay. has good good medicinal value, you know, it's becoming more and more approved in different places. So it's like a high demand for this quality down here. Yeah. You know, so they're shipping it out, you know. I think just the other day they shipped out probably a ton or so. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And is it pharmaceutical companies buying it as well? Of course. Of course. But I'm not sure how all the procedures go because I was not very interested in getting legalized with those guys and signing up because to me I feel like I'm a slave. And working for them, they have all the, the manipulation, they bank your money, they tax you, they, I don't know. I don't understand the ramification. I yeah. don't know, I'm not interested though. I'm interested in smoking the ganja. <laughs> yeah. So Luciano is going to ask a couple of questions. Do you want me to film? No, just one. Um, okay. At the end of like every episode, we always do like a silly question, yeah. make a silly question. Why not? When I met you, like the first thing that that you said with Bolsonaro is destroying the Amazon yeah, yeah, and and then you know they basically he's basically like the new Hitler mm -hmm. so um, my question to you is like what about if uh, Bolsonaro come to this island on holiday would you take him for for as long as he can pay but I will <laughs> I will raise the issue to him as uh, well I hope he doesn't get vexed and try to strike me you that's know, a clever answer. Yeah, but I'll raise the issue to him. I'll raise the issue because it's a fundamental issue that is affecting the entire world. So why shouldn't I raise it to him? Is, is he going to pay me not to raise this question? How much is he going to pay, by the way? A million dollars? Well, <laughs> then I don't raise the question. No, I don't think you're going to get a million dollars no, from that guy. No, <laughs> He's probably going to try to get for free. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, Bolsonaro almost killed Alex just by mentioning Bolsonaro's name. Alex was coughing so much that we had to stop the interview. Alex is now fully recovered. Stay tuned for our next episode.